Some people like to talk about the weather, but I'm going to talk about weathering rolling stock on Ron's Trains and Things right now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ron of Ron's Trains and Things, and welcome to the show. If this is your first time joining me and you want to see more videos about model railroading tips, tools, and techniques, subscribe down below and hit that little bell icon so you can catch every episode. One thing that most model railroaders strive for on their layouts is a sense of realism. That is, they want to have structures that look realistic and prototypical to the areas that they model. They want to have locomotives and rolling stock that look appropriate to the time period that they model. They want to have scenery that looks realistic for the areas that they model as well. One of the things that creates a sense of realism as much as anything else is excellent weathering, both on structures as well as on locomotives and rolling stock. Well, today we're going to talk about some techniques for weathering rolling stock. Now, there are many different kinds of techniques that you can use to do some great, realistic weathering on rolling stock, and those techniques can vary from one type of rolling stock to another. So I'm going to do several videos over the course of the next few months on different techniques for weathering rolling stock and different types of rolling stock and ways that we can weather them that are appropriate for that particular type of car. Today, we're going to be looking at some techniques that I use in weathering some of my covered hoppers to make them look rusted and dirty like they've been in service for a while. While I'm weathering this particular covered hopper today, I'm also going to be upgrading it to metal wheel sets, and you'll see the whole process, so let's get over to the workbench and get started. Several years ago, when Atlas came out with their N-Scale Trainman line, I bought several pieces of these rolling stock, specifically for the purpose of trying some new weathering techniques. The Trainman line is an economy line of rolling stock. The details on these cars are not quite as fine as they are on some of the better lines made by Atlas and other companies, but there are some great rolling stock to practice when it comes to doing some super detailing, some upgrading, and in this case, some weathering. This is the last one of those cars I still have on hand, and so I'm going to use it to show you some weathering techniques today. You see the stirrup steps and the ladders are not quite as fine as you might like if you were looking for a little finer detailed car, but it makes a nice car once it's weathered. The first step in this process is to disassemble the car. I remove the trucks using a precision screwdriver just to pry them off. These trucks use a pressure fit bolster pin, and so you just pry them off with a little bit of pressure. Then I'm going to remove the wheel sets. You do this simply by squeezing the truck lightly and prying one side of the axle out of the journal pocket and then the other side should pop right out. We're going to upgrade these wheels with Fox Valley wheels. Next I put the trucks into this jig. I saw this jig on a model railroader video several years ago and it is a very handy jig for painting trucks and couplers and you can see I can do four cars worth of trucks at one time with this jig. Put them in here to, uh, to to paint them they make it a great handle. I'm going to upgrade the wheel sets to Fox Valley model wheel sets but I have to first know which wheel sets to use so I have to measure the length of these axles to make sure I get the right ones. Make sure that your caliper is set to uh, decimal inches and as you see this is a 0.56 axle length. I have this small tackle box that I keep a lot of wheel sets on hand, different sizes of wheels, different lengths of axles, and here is the uh, set of wheel sets that I need from Fox Valley. So we'll pull four of those out to upgrade this car to metal wheels. While I'm at this, I go ahead and paint the faces of the wheels. I'm using railroad tie brown here and a micro brush just to paint the face. Make sure you keep the paint off of the tread and off of the axle point. Uh, you can also mix in some rust and it looks pretty realistic as well. Next I'm going to weather the roof walk and I'm going to use this Model Masters Grimy Black to do that. I'm going to do this in sort of a wash. 
Uh, I don't really want to weather the roof walk a lot, but I do want to get some black down into the texture and the details of the roof walk in order to make that relief stand out. So what I'm actually doing is I'm putting the paint on full strength. This Model Master's paint is fairly thin to begin with. And then I will add some water to it to help move it around and smooth it out to get it down into the details without leaving a lot of paint sitting on the top of the roof walk itself. Here you can see how dipping my brush in the water allows this paint to, to get down into the, the detailed texture of the roof walk. It allows me to make a little paint go a long way. And again, I'm, I'm not trying to heavily weather this car. I'm going to give it kind of a moderate weathering and rusting. And so I don't want a lot of paint on the top surface of the roof walk. Just want to get some black down into that texture so to allow that uh, detail to stand out. With that done, I'm going to bring in some artist oils. I'm using two colors today, a burnt umber and a raw sienna. Burnt umber for uh, some older rust and the raw and the raw sienna for for newer rust patches and then uh, also some turpenoid to uh, to clean my brush and to thin the paint as uh, as I do the weathering with it. First I'm going to squeeze just a small amount of each kind of paint into this mixing palette and then this is a little tool that I made for applying paint in this process. It's just a small piece of brass wire pushed into a small piece of balsa wood. Put a little bit of turpenoid into the middle of my mixing palette and I use this soft artist's brush to, uh, to make the streaks on my paint uh, in a few moments when we get there. I'm going to begin by using some of the burnt umber and I'm going to start on the roof and specifically I'm adding some rust patches at the base of the stanchions that hold the roof walk up. That is a place that will tend to hold water and where you will tend to see rust form and rust streaks coming from. And so that's where we'll begin here. I also add a few uh, patches of the, the newer rust with the raw sienna. Uh, you won't see as much of the newer rust because over time that rust naturally gets darker. And so uh, usually the, the newer rush, the fre fresher rust, will be smaller amounts on a car. So I always want to use more of the darker color and less of the lighter. Now when I've got those patches in place, I'm going to take my brush, get a little bit of turpenoid on it. I want to brush it, most of it off. I don't want, a little bit goes a long way on the turpenoid here. And I'm just going to very lightly streak those patches across the roof down to the, the edge of the, the side of the car. This turns those rust patches into rust streaks that look very much like the prototype would look when rain has run and, and taken the rust down the roof and down to the side of the car. Turn the car around, do the same thing on the other side, and get some streaking down uh, that side of the roof as well. And then with the sides of the roof done, I want to come in and do a little rusting on the hatches. You want to make sure you especially apply some rust to the hatch latches and hinges. Those are areas that wear, the paint naturally wears off of those most quickly, and so they are some of the first areas that will start to rust. I'm also going to add just a few patches to the hatches themselves. Now when I go to streak these patches on the roof, because the roof is is the peak or the top of the car and these hatches are domed and that rust is going to streak down both sides of the hatches so I want to use my brush to pull that paint in both directions on these hatches so I get streaking kind of evenly somewhat down both sides you don't want it to be too symmetrical you don't want it to, to look unnatural but uh, you do want it to get some streaking going both directions off the top of, of your hatches with the roof done, I'm going to let that dry before I go on, but the next day I come in and start working on the first side of the car. 
And here you'll see that I'm putting some, some fresh rust on uh, some sections of, of the ladders here. And then I'm going to use my older rust, that burnt umber, to start adding uh, some spots where rust will form and streak down from where the, where the side of the car meets the roof. And so we're just going to put some blotches and patches there, and then we're going to come back with a little turpenoid on our brush and just streak that gently down the side of the car. You want to use a very light touch here. If you use a very heavy touch as you're streaking, you'll pull all of the paint off and you won't get any streaking effect. You also want to make sure you make perfectly straight strokes down the side of the car. Uh, if your strokes are wavy or if they are crooked, uh, the paint will not look natural. Water and thus rust naturally runs straight down the side of a car, so you want to make your streaks as straight as you can. And you see here how we got some nice streaks, especially here along uh, some of the ribs on the sides. I want a little more streaking that than that, so I'm going to come back and add some paint here uh, to the edges of some of the ribs. We'll tend to see rust running right down the ribs on the side of a car. And so I'm going to do a little more. Each time I do a layer of this, I need to wait for the turpenoid to dry before I go on to add more paint. You also need to remember you'll run the risk when you do your next batch uh, of, uh, of streaking to, that you might accidentally take off some of the streaks that you had made on a previous batch. So you want to be very, very careful about that. But be sure you let the turpenoid dry each time. Once I'm happy with my streaking, I want to come back and make some rust patches on the side of the car. One of the first places that rust patches tend to show up are on the lettering. Uh, these Burlington Northern cars were notorious for having the white lettering peel and for developing rust patches on this white lettering. And so I'm going to not heavily rust this, but I'm going to add some patches of rust just very carefully right in the lettering itself. Uh, where some of that uh, lettering has, has popped off and began to rust. Once those patches are in place, I want to streak them down the side just like I did uh, the streaks from the top of the roof and because those rust patches will, will tend to produce uh, streaks of rust where the water from rain washes them down the car. And there you can see it got some nice streaking. Now sometimes when you're streaking you will obliterate the rust patch itself. That's okay. The streaks will show you where the rust patch should be. Just come back with a little more of the artist oils and touch up the rust patches after you've done the streaking and then allow them to dry thoroughly. You also uh, can do some streaking on the slope sheets of the bays of the hopper itself and around some of the uh, mechanical mechanisms on the bottom. It's going to have a little bit of rust there. And here you see one side of my car with the rust patches finished. Don't forget to do the ends of the cars as well. Uh, you want to get some rust there. After all of my artist oils have dried on both sides, then it's time to go to the paint booth. I start by spraying the ends of the car using a little bit of grimy black or railroad tie brown to get some splash up on the ends of the cars. Uh, in this case I use grimy black and I use the same grimy black to paint the sides of the trucks. Then I'm going to Model Masters Light Ghost Gray to do a fade coat on the sides of the car itself. Uh, you'll notice here I'm fading the car just a little bit all the way up and this helps tone down the rust, helps blend everything together. And I'm doing an extra pass or two on the lower sides of the car where you would get some dust that would uh, tend to settle on the car. Make sure you do the ends as well. Get uh, some of that light gray inside of those slope sheets and it'll help some of those brake details and things stand out. Finally, I use a, a rust color to come back and carefully put a, a light coat of paint on the couplers themselves. In this case, I'm actually using a Rio Grande building uh, brown, which has got a kind of a rusty color. What they mark it as rust is often too red. So this, this color, I think, makes a nice rust color. You want to build that up slowly and not get too much on it too fast. 
After all that paint is dried, I come back with a grimy black or sometimes an oily black and paint the trip pins again black. And then uh, you don't see it here, but uh, ultimately I'll come in with a silver Sharpie and uh, just touch the end of it with silver. Once all that paint is dried, it's time to reassemble the car. I start by taking my metal wheel sets and popping them into the trucks where they belong. I always kind of give them a spin and a roll to make sure that uh, they are rolling properly as they should. And then I reinstall the trucks. It's, I find it easiest to put the bolster pin into the truck and then to push it into the bolster on the car uh, from there. I use the end of my tweezers here just to push it down, make sure it's in place, make sure that it turns freely, isn't too loose or wobbly and uh, we'll have a, a good rolling car that way. And with that, our weathering job is complete and this piece of rolling stock is ready for the layout. It's got some nice rust and weathering to it there. I think it will fit in well on my layout and I think the effects on this car came out pretty good. I hope you'll try some of these techniques and I hope you'll let me know what you think of uh, the techniques as I've used them today. One of the most important factors to developing your skills in weathering is not being afraid to try. That's why I think it's really helpful sometimes to buy some less expensive rolling stock to practice your weathering techniques on. And you might find that those pieces that aren't as detailed as you'd like look a lot better once they've been weathered. Might be something you want to put on your layout after all. So I hope you'll give some of these techniques a try. The most important thing is don't be afraid to give it a shot. Also, you want to make sure that you build up that weathering slowly a little bit at a time and then you won't overweather it and ruin a car very quickly. I hope you'll give some of these techniques a try, and if you do, be sure to leave me a comment down in the comment section below this video. Let me know what your experience is and how things work out for you. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Ron's Trains and Things. If so, give it a thumbs up down below. Be sure and leave that comment and question at the bottom. I love to hear your comments and I always respond. Also, check out that expanded description down below this video where you can see my Amazon pick of the week. You might find something that you find interesting there. Also, you can see a link to my Facebook page that I keep for my layout, the Texas, Colorado, and Western, as well as ways that you can support Ron's Trains and Things through my Patreon or PayPal Me account. And above all else, be sure to subscribe to this channel and click that little bell notification icon so that you'll get notified every time I upload a new video. Also, if you found this video helpful or enjoyable, be sure and share it on your social media and model railroad forums that you participate in so others can benefit from it as well. I thank you so much for watching today, and I hope that you'll tune in Friday as I have something a little special coming up. Uh, I put together a little outtake reel in celebration of my reaching 500 subscribers, and that'll be coming this Friday, so you want to be sure and tune in for that. Also, I had a little mini contest that you only knew about if you watched to the very end past the credits of my video about casting and painting rocks last week. In it, I promised that the first five people to respond in a certain way in the comments section would be included in a shout-out video, and that video will be coming out next week. So be sure and watch next week for that video. You'll enjoy seeing the shout-out to some of those people who watch my channel on a regular basis, and you'll enjoy learning about their channels as well. So I hope you join me, and I will see you then.